um, and uh, remind you of what we've got. And I won't find it in Revelation 1. No. Okay, Acts chapter 1. In the first book of Theophilus, I've dealt with all that Jesus began to do and teach until the day when he was taken up after he had given commandment to the Holy Spirit to the apostles whom he had chosen. To them he presented himself alive after his passion by many proofs, appearing to them during forty days and speaking of the kingdom of God. And while staying with them, he charged them not to depart from Jerusalem, but to wait for the promise of the Father, which he said, You have from me. For John baptized with water, but for many days you shall be baptized with the Holy Spirit. So when he had come together, they asked him, Lord, will you at this time restore the kingdom to Israel? He said to them, It is not for you to know the times or the seasons which the Father has fixed by his own authority, but you shall receive power when the Holy Spirit has come upon you. You shall be my witnesses in Jerusalem and in Judea and Samaria to the ends of the earth. When he had said this, as we were looking on, he was lifted up in a cloud to find his sight. And while they were gazing into heaven as he went, behold, two men stood by them with white robes and said, Men of Galilee, why do you stand looking into heaven? This Jesus, who was taken up from you to heaven, will come in the same way as you saw him go into heaven. I won't read any further than that, because uh, I'm pretty sure we'll get as far as, as the end of that there. Okay, uh, so we've, we've seen uh, uh, that uh, Luke is a reliable historian. We've seen Luke um, uh, talking about uh, not only what Jesus did I, as in his gospel, but what Jesus is continuing to do. Uh, even after his death, there was resurrection. Uh, and uh, he showed himself uh, uh, through many proofs, uh, <laughs> accurate proofs, uh, in, indisputable proofs, uh, to a number of people over a, a period of time. Uh, and uh, they were able to then become, uh, or will become, witnesses of that which they have seen about the resurrection of Christ. Because the resurrection of Christ is crucial, not only to Christ, uh, to uh, uh, put a stamp of authority on everything he'd said and done in his lifetime, the resurrection was the final proof, but it also uh, is, is uh, important for us. Uh, Paul in 1 Corinthians uh, talks in terms of, if Jesus wasn't raised from the dead, he says, our faith is vain, we're wasting our time. Uh, and, and so it's important to uh, understand and emphasize the reality, the strength and the power that's found in the resurrection of Christ. Uh, and uh, so uh, he's talking to the apostles here, uh, the, the text says men of Galilee, and that uh, identifies the twelve, or this time the eleven. And uh, he charges them not to depart from Jerusalem, but to wait for the promise of the Father, which he said, you have from me. Uh, and we've looked the last couple of weeks on the promises that Jesus uh, spoke and said to them, uh, especially in the book of John, in that last week uh, of the life of Jesus. And so uh, involved in all that, Jesus says all those promises, wait in Jerusalem, because a lot of it's going to come true in Acts chapter 2. He didn't say Acts chapter 2, then, because obviously they didn't have Acts chapter 2. But that's the implication, all right? Wait in Jerusalem until you see the promise uh, that he said, and power. It's got a promise that's going to come with power in Acts chapter 2. And I think by June, when we get to chapter 2, uh, you're going to be impressed by what you see there. Which June will that be? Uh, maybe, maybe this year, hopefully this year, Frank. All right? So, uh, uh, we'll, we'll just keep hanging in there. You know, I, it's, 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 the, it's like Coronation Street. We'll always finish on a high, you know? Uh, so, you'll be excited to get there. All right. Uh, so, last week we looked at the, the little verse there talking down. So, John baptized with water before many days. You shall be baptized with the Holy Spirit. Uh, and we'll look at the distinction of that. Uh, and we'll look back also in, in uh, Matthew chapter 3 uh, and 1 to uh, verse 13 there, uh, where John talks about two baptisms, a uh, baptism of the Holy Spirit and a baptism of fire. Uh, and then we looked at some of the ideas involved in that and realized that basically we don't want the baptism of fire particularly because that's dealing with punishment, that's dealing with hell. Uh, and anybody who wants uh, to be baptized with fire today, uh, I think is, is uh, on a sticky wicket, okay? Uh, because they're asking for the wrong thing. Uh, and that's, uh, uh, we, we, we saw that in, in fairly much detail last week. Uh, and then we moved on from there then um, onto this verse 6. Uh, when they came together, he says, Lord, will you at this time restore the kingdom? And I'll get on there and do the right thing, maybe. That's because it stays up there. Okay, <laughs> all right. What kind of kingdom do you think the apostles were thinking that Jesus would restore? I did talk a, a few minutes, of, uh, just at the tail end of last week about uh, the kingdom. But let's, let's you know, stick in that game. No, I mean, uh, feel free to, to make a comment on what kind of kingdom you, you, you have in mind 
or you think the apostles had in mind specifically at this particular time, <coughs> before Pentecost, after the death of Jesus, what are the apostles thinking of, of what kind of kingdom is going to be restored or what they wouldn't be restored? Well, something on earth. They're thinking, they're thinking physical? Yeah. Yeah. And the Romans get rid of them. Get rid of the Romans. That's a good. That's a good tra- uh, uh, war cry. Then. Let's get rid of the Romans. Okay. Yeah. Uh, Any more? No. Uh, restoring uh, Jesus is set on David's throne, physical throne in Jerusalem. Uh, with, with some of the, some people who who believe in in a literal restoration of what the apostles were thinking about at this particular time. They, they go to great lengths to, to demonstrate just how far things are going to be restored, including bringing back the sacrificial system. You know, that's good news. The lambs will be, be rushing out of the fields right now. They, they heard that was coming. But uh, uh, Jerusalem is going to be turned back into a sacrificial city. Uh, Jesus city, sitting on David's specific throne, and everybody will go back to Jerusalem. Now, if you think it's crowded today, then you'd be in real trouble, you know, when everybody went back to Jerusalem. Uh, yeah, it wouldn't be, uh, you're talking about starting to breathe in there, uh, the Russian sitting there, pews are open all busy. Uh, it's going to be stacked out if that was, if that was the reality of what was going to happen. But we know that's not going to happen. Because the same thing that the uh, apostles misunderstood back there is still the same thing that a lot of people misunderstand today. The, the kingdom they're looking for uh, is a physical kingdom, uh, a physical ruler sitting on a physical throne uh, with certain things are restored into physical uh, situation and, and we know that's not particularly true okay so they were still looking for the physical not the spiritual kingdom but I mean there was a lot of uh, uh, talk in the Old Testament that, that helped us to understand some of the things that uh, uh, Jesus was uh, uh, referring to uh, and Jesus said I will build my church uh, I will give Peter the keys of the kingdom uh, and he was talking in terms of spiritual keys uh, the keys being the gospel, uh, which Peter is going to use in the next chapter. And chapter 18 of, of the, the same, uh, same book, uh, you talk, all the apostles were, were told the same thing. They were all going to have keys with the power to loose and the power to bind. Uh, and uh, involved in God's spiritual kingdom. And even though Jesus was saying these two things to them, basically a lot of it was going straight over the head. Uh, they just didn't understand. But it's also, uh, this is future term. Jesus in Matthew 18, uh, a couple of, and 16 and 18, a couple of chapters before this, he said, I will build my kingdom. Uh, and so that tells us that the kingdom Jesus had in mind was a future kingdom. It obviously hadn't been built in his time. Uh, and there was all sorts of other things involved that, that gave us parameters in that. There's other chapters that, that talk in terms of uh, uh, weight uh, for the kingdom. Uh, Mark 9, verse 1, he talks about uh, wait in Jerusalem until you receive power from on high. Uh, the kingdom will come with power. So you tie in uh, the power, you tie in what's going to happen in Jerusalem, uh, something special is going to happen to the apostles, and, and that gives you a time and a place. And also means it's future. <coughs> they were still here in this chapter, chapter 1, they were still waiting, they're being told, wait in Jerusalem. So whatever was going to happen, it was still future in the time of the apostles here. And, and therefore it's helpful to un- help us to understand. Now uh, the book of Isaiah has got lots of stuff talking about God's kingdom. And it's often a very misunderstood book. Uh, the, the Jehovah's Witnesses have come around, they use this quite often. They, they show a little picture on the front of the tract with the lion lying down with the lamb. And they're thinking physical. Uh, the physical lion lying down with the physical lamb. Or well, as Isaiah's got in mind, he says, there's all sorts of people out there, for example, like Apostle Peter uh, and, and John, the beloved, uh, they, they wouldn't have been the best uh, uh, bedfellows under normal circumstances, or even Judas. Uh, and yet, in Christ, the they most unlikely people uh, get, get along together. They, they, they learn to work together. Um, so in Isaiah chapter 2, verse 2 to 4, he predicted the kingdom would be established in the last days. And that's a phrase that's going to come up later on in this chapter, in the last days, because Peter, uh, in, in his uh, sermon in chapter 2, is going to be talking about the last days. And he is saying uh, that what Joel was talking about, about the last days, is being fulfilled in Acts chapter 2. These are the last days, he says. So Isaiah, looking forward and, and thinking, because Isaiah uh, was a, a messianic prophet, 
he, he talked a lot about the Messiah, about the Christ coming. And therefore, a, a lot of his texts have got, all, if not a double meaning, certainly a, 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 a spiritual meaning. A, and uh, then you're going to see the apostles take these, these uh, texts, just like people like Isaiah, and we're going to look at Daniel in a minute, and, and they're going to show these texts uh, as important texts to understand uh, what would happen, when it would happen, and what the kingdom was going to be all about. So God's kingdom was going to be established in the last days. Daniel chapter 2 predicted a kingdom to be established in the days of the Roman Empire. If you remember in Daniel chapter 2, he's got this picture of a, a, a statue uh, uh, interpreting a dream. Uh, and uh, he says to, to uh, Nebuchadnezzar, he says, you are the head of gold. Uh, and then he goes on to describe the, the Medo-Persian Empire, then the, the Greek Empire, and then uh, and the finally and feet, the, the Roman Empire. And he says, in the days of those kings, in the days of that final empire, that Roman empire, would God would set up a kingdom. A kingdom that would be an eternal kingdom. But it wouldn't be a physical kingdom. But yet it would have so much power that it actually would outlast and basically destroy the physical kingdoms that had come before it. And so, and when we look back in time now, uh, the, the great... A Babylonian Empire lasted a very short period of time, and uh, it came and it went. And then the Medo-Persian Empire, which is a huge empire, uh, and, and a lot of this fighting you see over in Iraq and all around that, Turkey and all that area today, that, that was a huge empire, very powerful in its day. Uh, and uh, that, that empire too fell, fell foul of the great Alexander uh, with his Macedonian uh, father uh, as he came charging out of, the, out of the middle of nowhere and took on the world. And then at the end of 33 years old, he, he is said to have been buried with his hands open. No more worlds to conquer. Uh, there's a lot of uh, um, a suspicion that he, he drunk himself to death, some people say, and others say he was poisoned. But uh, basically, it, by the time, when, if you read any of his, uh, of his uh, history, uh, his, his men were tired by the end. He was still wanting to conquer more worlds, and they'd had enough. They, they, they conquered all the world as far as they were concerned and were ready to go back home. Uh, and by the end of his, of his reign, uh, they, they're pretty tired. There's one story talked about a particular castle that they, they, they attack. Uh, and his men by this time are just really they're half-heartedly going at it. And they're being beaten back. And so Alexander uh, leaps to the front and, and, and actually uh, charges the, the wall of this uh, castle by himself. He's up the wall and his men are going, oh, that's crazy. Where, where's he off to? And, and they, they chase him after him up these ladders to climb up and, and he gets knocked off the ladder. Uh, and as he falls down, uh, a bunch of men seeing the, the people up on top begin to throw their spears and stuff down to kill him, uh, leapt on top of him to protect him. He gave his life for him. But after that, the whole thing was really rejuvenated and they, they really took that place and just took it apart. But they were getting tired by the end of his empire. And so uh, then he was uh, overcome by the, the Roman Empire, which became even as far as here in Britain. Uh, didn't quite get into parts of Scotland. You know, we held it back. But they, uh, <laughs> really, they had one look over the wall and we don't want to go there. But anyway, they, um, they, there's a lot of, you know, a big powerful empire. They were more successful than we were. <laughs> <laughs> yes. Uh, no comment, right? Okay. <laughs> the, uh, the, uh, it was a, a big empire, the Roman Empire, uh, and, and Daniel says, in the days of those kings, in the days of the Roman Empire, God is going to set up a kingdom. Uh, and so here, uh, in time past, uh, a, a kingdom is predicted. Uh, and all the Jews are thinking to themselves, well, you know, uh, we are part of God's kingdom, so whatever's going to happen, that's going to involve us. We're going to look forward to the Messiah coming. And that's why a lot of this nationalism and a lot of this physical concepts were taken on. Because the, the Babylonians were real and physical. The they Medo-Persians were real and physical. The they, uh, Greeks were real and physical. The Romans are real and physical. Therefore, why shouldn't we get back on the, on the bandwagon and have a, a real physical um, empire as well as all them? And, and even bigger and even better because God is on our side. Uh, but the kingdom at that time was still future. And so uh, in Mark 3 verse 2 and Matthew 5 14, uh, he says, uh, uh, John comes out, he's preaching, he says, the kingdom is at hand. The kingdom is near. The kingdom is, 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 is just around the corner, if you want to use our terminology. Uh, so as part of the message of preparing the way for the Messiah, the way of the Lord, he's saying, it's coming close, it's coming nearer. Uh, and therefore, uh, um, Jesus said, uh, as I said before, Matthew 16, he says, I will build my church, still future sense. 
uh, and it refers to the keys of the kingdom. So the church and the kingdom in this context are bound together. There is a wider context of the kingdom. I remember Frank saying that when he was a young man, he was challenged to, to look through his Bible and, and uh, look at all the instances of the kingdom and divide them up into four parts. Uh, well, divide them up and see how many parts you come up with, I suppose. Uh, and it ended up with four major parts. The national kingdom, the uh, universal. universal kingdom, and the spiritual kingdom. Spiritual kingdom and the eternal kingdom. Eternal kingdom. I knew that. <laughs> so uh, uh, these and, and and sometimes when you're reading some parts of scripture, you, you've got to think. You know, are we talking about which kingdom are we talking about here? Uh, and and that's important because being able to rightly divide the world like that. But at this point in this context, Jesus is talking about, I will build my church, so it's future tense, and he gives Peter the keys of the kingdom. So that's future tense. What do you do with keys? You open the door. That's when the, the kingdom is going to be opened up. The gospel is going to be preached and people are going to flow into God's kingdom. When Peter preaches the gospel on the first day of Pentecost, and we know that's around the corner, so it's still future. Now some people get all mixed up. As I say, <coughs> some people uh, come to your door, like a Joseph Witnesses, and say, the kingdom came in 1914. Then they change their mind and it came invisibly. And then they do some other stuff and whatever. Uh, and then other people will say, the kingdom came earlier. Uh, uh, other people who say that the kingdom came in the time of John the Baptizer. Uh, and that's why they can relate some of the stuff that John the Baptist said about entering into the kingdom. Uh, and they apply that today. So they get confused and say, how do you become uh, part of the kingdom of God? Uh, and all sorts of, of, of misconceptions uh, uh, make room there. <coughs> so Mark 15, uh, Joseph of Arimathea is still waiting for the kingdom after the resurrection. So here's Joseph Arimathea, he took the body of Christ uh, and, and he's thinking into still in terms of the kingdom after, uh, after Jesus' Jesus death. Okay? So he, he, Jesus has lived, he said in his life that the kingdom is coming, but even after his death, Joseph's still waiting for the kingdom to come, so it still hadn't come. And so therefore, uh, in Acts chapter 1 verse 6, oops, get me back there, Acts chapter 1 verse 6, just still waiting. Waiting for what? Waiting to go to Jerusalem, wait, waiting to in Jerusalem, waiting for that power to come, that special event to happen, uh, and the, the, op the, the opening of the kingdom, the gates to be opened uh, for the future. So they're still waiting in Acts chapter 1. So if anybody says the kingdom uh, was established during the lifetime of Jesus, they're, they're, they're misunderstanding uh, some of these texts. Matter of fact, misunderstanding, misunderstanding all of these texts, never mind. Right. So the kingdom is still future. So, yeah? No, uh the way, like, uh, I sort of took it before is about uh, Peter and the pearly gates and the keys to the kingdom and all that. Oh, you know? heaven! Kingdom yeah. Well, you see, Jesus talks about the kingdom of heaven, and it's easy to get confused. Because we, we are we are a kingdom of heaven on earth, or a colony of heaven on earth, as Paul, Paul talks in terms of, we are, we are a bit of heaven down here. And, and we have entered into uh, the, if you like, the early stages of the heavenly kingdom. Uh, uh, Paul later on in Romans talks in terms of, of salvation and three different types of salvation. He takes it. He talks about a salvation from past sins. He talks about a salvation from present sins, and then he talks about a future salvation. So there's different stages, and we we talk in terms of the kingdom being established in the first day of Pentecost. But as Frank said, the the, the four kingdoms that he mentioned: national, international. That's if you like in the Old Testament uh, picture of things. And then in the New Testament, we come into spiritual, and that's the church and the kingdom of God, the kingdom within you. You, uh, uh, Ephesian writer turns around and says, you have been delivered out of the kingdom of darkness into the kingdom of his dear son. So we, we move from, when we become Christians, we move out of the devil's kingdom, and we move into the kingdom of Christ. And that's in the beginning, uh, that's our, our, our beginning. But we still take, uh, uh, that's a spiritual reality, but we still live in a physical body. And uh, Paul in, in, in chapter 8 turns around and says, we await for uh, our body being delivered into that eternal kingdom. Uh, Jesus in, in, Matthew, in uh, 1 Corinthians chapter 15 near the end there, he turns around and says, when he comes back again, he's going to take the kingdom, that's you and me, and he's going to hand us over to God. His, his role as king in, in this part of the kingdom will be over. And then we will have started and we will have continued on our eternal Aspect of our kingdom. So, so when he says, I, I give uh, the keys, the keys of the kingdom, yeah. right? So that's the Gospels. 
Yeah, uh, it, it's, it, it's made a little bit more clear. <laughs> I, I, haven't, I haven't put up my, my Bible uh, one on here tonight, but I would have I've gone to the passage. If you look in the next cha- two chapters, chapter 18, uh, he talks about uh, the, giving these, these powers to all of the apostles, but involved in that, he talks about a loosing and a binding. So, in other words, when the, the gospel is preached, we, we let loose, if you like, the, the salvation for the world. But with that salvation also comes a binding, because if people reject that salvation, uh, for them, then in bad trouble, so the division takes place. It's good news for the ones who accept it, it's bad news for the ones who reject it. And so, uh, that's, that ties in with Jesus when he says in, in John chapter 12, my word will judge you, because the apostles take the word of Jesus, and they preach the word of Jesus. To let it loose, if you like. Uh, and in that process, that's the gospel going forth. Yeah. And then we're added. No, I'm just, because I just see it as, uh, you know, like they give the, king, uh, the, the keys to the kingdom to Peter. Do you know what I mean? Because he well, said it to Yes, in Matthew, you know what I mean? in Matthew 16, when Jesus said, you are Peter, and on this rock I will build my church, and give you the keys of the kingdom of heaven. What, whatsoever you shall bind on us, shall be bound in heaven. Whatsoever you shall loose on us, shall be loosed in heaven. But Graham says, two chapters later on, Jesus says the same thing to the twelve when he meets with them in the upper room. He says, whatever you bind on earth, shall be bound in heaven. Whatever you loose on earth, shall be loosed in heaven. So they all, all the apostles have the same authority, the same power. <coughs> it's simply that Peter had the privilege of preaching the gospel for the very first time on the day of Pentecost. He was the one that opened the kingdom on that day when he told people what to do, as Graham says, to be saved. On like, the first time it's preached. That's right. Yeah. Peter preached the, the gospel for the first time and told people how to get their sins forgiven. And, and, and that day, 3,000 of them entered the kingdom because of Peter's preaching. Yeah. But after that, all the apostles preached the same message. It's... Um Metaphoric language it's used, isn't it? Well, you said because the word, there is not, there the isn't a pair of the, gates. There the isn't a physical is the, gate. Is the key th- is the key thing, because Jesus used the word key. He said to the scribes and Pharisees, "You have you hold the kingdom of you hold the keys of knowledge." But you said he said you shut the door and you and you, you, you won't let people in. So whenever a scribe was appointed, there was a <coughs> ceremony at which a key was presented to him. Mm-hmm. Which, it, which was symbolic of the fact that he had the authority to open the scriptures to the people. So the key stands for authority. What Jesus gave to Peter on the day uh, in, in Matthew 16 was authority with regards to the opening of the kingdom. And he used it at Pentecost. Graham was telling you about that later, wasn't you, Graham? Yeah. There is uh, not really pearly gates up there. <laughs> there is not if he ever really gets there. Oh, come on, you're spoiling my losers now. <laughs> <laughs> well, I thought it would help Paddy, you because know, maybe he thinks there is a sort of, okay. regular, sort of gates we've got to go through. It says, uh, I don't think so, anyway. Verse 18, it says, truly I said to you, whatever you bind on earth <coughs> should be bound in heaven, whether you loosen there should be loosened in heaven. And, and he's saying this to the to the all the apostles now. To the eleven. To the eleven at this point, yeah. So, uh, mm-hmm. So what he said to, to Peter, because Peter had answered that question in the way he did, Jesus gave him this, if you will, this new, uh, very powerful, special revelation for us, in, in the sense of, uh, because he answered the question, Thou art the Christ, the Son of the living God, there's a play of words in there, I won't go into that at the moment, but it, the, the implication is, he says, boy, you, you've cracked it, and what I am, the Christ, the Son of the living God, that is what's going to save people. That's what's going to deliver people. And, and because you understand that, and because you're going to preach that, who is the Christ? At the end of the chapter 2 in his sermon, he said, this Jesus, whom you crucified, God raised up. So he, in, in the very sermon, he highlights the deity of Christ in his death, burial, and resurrection, and the fact that now salvation is open to everybody. And 3,000 people said, goodness, you mean Jesus was the Messiah? Jesus was the Christ? What are we going to do about it? And, and 3,000 people become Christians. Well, they didn't become Christians, but they, uh, and by implication, became Christians on the first day of Pentecost. Because Peter, in his first sermon, using the keys of knowledge, if you like, a knowledge of understanding of who the Christ was, and what the Christ has done for everybody, and what is, he's made available for everybody because of his blood, uh, we can all have salvation. And he uses that. And then, 
as all the apostles went out, and including Matthias, Matthew, Matthias later as he joined them as a witness, as they went out in all parts of the world later, they, they had taken the keys of the gospel. And when you and I go and talk to somebody about Christ and they've never really listened, uh, you know, heard about him, the, a lot of people hear about Christ, but when you actually talk to them about the Christ and the gospels and open up to them what the word of God says, you're using the same key that Peter used. You're using it by the same authority. Uh, Jesus, if you like, in a chain of authority, God says to Jesus in Mark, in Mark, Mark chapter 9 verse 1, He says, This is my beloved Son. Hear ye him. Listen to him. The Hebrew writer turns around and says the same thing in chapter 1. God, who in, in many and various ways spoke in times past to the prophets, but in these last days speaks to His Son. Now His Son comes along and He says to the apostles, I'm teaching you. For three years almost, I'm going to teach you, I'm going to teach you, and you're not going to understand it all, but I'm going to teach you. And then as we saw the other week, uh, he says to the Holy, I'm not going to leave you comfortless. The Holy Spirit's going to come, and he's going to bring to your remembrance everything that I have said. So here God said something to Jesus. Jesus has passed <coughs> out something on to the apostles. The apostles then go out and preach it and teach it. Luke sits down and writes it all down. And what do we do? When we take our Bible, when we open up the pages of Scripture to people, we are doing exactly the same thing in the same line of authority. So, if, if you don't believe what I say, if, if provided I say what the Scriptures say, if you don't believe what I say, you're not, or people are not saying, uh, I'm wrong. They're saying that the Scriptures are wrong. Uh, and that was the revelation that the Holy Spirit made through the Apostles. So they're not saying the Apostles are wrong, because that was the revelation that Jesus gave to the apostles. They're not even saying Jesus is wrong. Because when they reject Jesus, what they're actually doing is saying, I don't believe what God says. So, when Peter got those, that message in the first day of Pentecost, provided we repeat the message faithfully, we are doing exactly the same as Peter did, in exactly the same way, and unfortunately, 3,000 don't respond. You know, but that's, uh, you know, that's our fault, not, not the Gospel's fault. So, uh, by the same authority that God has laid down in Scripture, if we trust in that Scripture and, and teach that Scripture faithfully, then we are passing on the same message that Jesus gave to the apostles, that God gave to Jesus, that men and women might be saved today. With the same hope of eternal destiny as these people had back in the day of Pentecost. Heaven is opened up for them. On 3,000 said, yes. That'll do me. And thousands down the ages ever since have followed it, have been obedient to it, and have the same promises opened up to them today. So that's the, that's the difference. Where some people understand that Peter only had the key, a key, uh, maybe in some sort of even physical, symbolic way, or whatever, that's a misunderstanding of, of what Jesus was saying to him. The, the key was that the gospel had <coughs> opened up, uh, and he was the first person to use it. So you couldn't become a Christian before Acts chapter 2. You couldn't become a Christian before Peter used the key, because the door of the kingdom hadn't been opened. Interesting, isn't it? But, you know, any, you know, throw in, it's, it's helpful to me if you, if you throw in you know, any, anything you don't quite understand, or, that's, that's useful. But here, here in this, if you, when you go home tonight, if you have a look at Acts chapter 18, you see, and this, this is exactly the same thing he said uh, to Peter. Whatever you bind, shall be bound. Whatever you loose, shall be loosed. And in this context, in 18, he's talking to the 11. Whereas in 16, he was saying, because of Peter's response, he was saying directly to Peter. Now he's opened up and, and he's saying, okay, you guys, you know, this is, this is serious stuff. Uh, you're, going to, you're going to help people to see me more clearly. But you're also going to, in the very process, you're going to turn people away. And so you, you, they, they are, if they don't listen to you, uh, you know, you're going to uh, bind them forever. And if you, or have one bound on them, if, if, if you do listen to them, it'll be loose, other way around, whatever. Okay, but yeah, I get the idea. It's worth, worth have a, a look at that. It's good stuff. But, um, yeah, the keys of the king, that's good, good stuff. So we've got, we, when you go out and you preach the gospel to somebody today, you're using exactly the same as what Peter did. You're using the keys to open people's minds to the word of God and to eternal destiny. You don't have to hang around the gates of heaven uh, until you uh, uh, sort things out. But there could be pearly gates. There could be pearly gates. Okay. 
All right. Um, okay. So, the, the, but this, in this case, uh, the kingdom is still future. The kingdom and church is intermingled together, uh, and, and it's and it's in its in its spiritual state now. We are limited by human bodies, but it's got a a, a different dimension, an eternal dimension, uh, and that's the that's the, really the promise of God, and that's something like for Jack. When, when Jack uh, is here in his funeral on Thursday, uh, that's a reality. Because Jack walked with God now in the spiritual dimension of the kingdom, he has now walked through and begun his eternal dimension of the kingdom. His problems are over. The old body that holds us all back with its desires, with its, with its uh, uh, weaknesses, left behind. Nothing left there. He's moved on. Shuffled off, some people don't worry, shuffling off your mortal coil, which is an interesting phrase. <laughs> but uh, anyway, uh, I suppose that's what happened to old people, they shuffle off. No, okay. They, uh, <laughs> something. They, they just <laughs> I, I, I was watching it. Well, it's the mortal coil. We thought you got a revised version there. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, that's, that's my, my brain doing the, the uh, yeah, the brain 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 brain. Brain. warming here. Yeah. Uh, okay, I've done that again. I'm going to put my Sorry. Okay, all these verses make it plain that the church of the kingdom was established was 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 not established until after John's death. Now there are people today who preach that the kingdom. John preached the gospel of the kingdom in that way as a, as a fulfillment. But John was preaching future. And so uh, all those passages show the kingdom was still future, even until after Jesus died. And the Hebrew writer is interesting because he turns around and says, without the death of a... It's a bit funny. It's, all the, it's an authorized guy. Uh, without the death of a testator, uh, the will doesn't come into effect. That's, that's a mix-up of my translation as well. Yeah, more than that. Okay. Uh, Jack's will doesn't come into effect until the solicitors read the will. Okay? But the, whoever benefits from the will couldn't benefit while Jack was alive. Jack had to die. And, Jesus, and, and the kingdom here, uh, the same principle follows, that Hebrew writer says, Jesus had to die, his blood had to be shed before we could come, become part of the kingdom of God. Because it's the blood that makes the difference. It's the, it's the blood that's why we're saved. It's not because we're good looking. It's the blood of Christ that saves us. <coughs> and the blood had to be shed. So the, the kingdom couldn't come into existence until the blood was shed and, and, and death of Jesus uh, did its job uh, and, and his, and his uh, in plan of redeeming man. So what did it still... Uh, okay, there's, a, there's a passage, Hebrews chapter 9, verse 15 to 17. Why do you think that Jesus uh, didn't say, okay, when, uh, when's, when's he going to establish this kingdom? He could have said to them, look, just uh, in ten days' time, you're going to know all about it. He could easily have said that. Why do you, do you think he didn't? Why do you think because he kept he it said, straight? He said, it's not for you to know the times and the seasons which the Father has retained in his own power. Okay, that's up to God. Okay, right. you, just, you just worry about what you worry about. Let God worry about his, his problems, okay? You just wait. Trust. I think of a, 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 an element in that, okay? Sometimes as human beings, we, we run before God. We, we sometimes think we know better than God. Uh, and, and it's good for God sometimes every now and again to turn around and say, you know, who's in charge here? You're me. And, and that's in a way, that's what Jesus was saying to them. Don't you worry about things that don't concern you. But I'll tell you what, he says, you're going to get a real pleasant surprise just right around the corner. There's something special going to happen to you just very soon. So that was the more important thing. Any, any questions? You all right for that? Okay. Why do you think Jesus didn't stop and explain the spiritual kingdom to the apostles? He could have, he could have, gone, he could have said this what right, I just said, couldn't he? <coughs> Why didn't he tell them about heaven? Why didn't he tell them about heaven? He was, I mean, Lots of things he didn't tell them, Brian. That's right. That's it. It's interesting. There's, there, there's a time, I think mentally, I mean, there are, you imagine, Jesus, they've walked and talked with Jesus for over two and a half years. Uh, and the, the now, they've, they've not only seen him die, which must have been a devastating thing in itself, but they've actually seen him alive, and now he's going to go again. I think, I think the answer to that question is, that was the job of the Holy Spirit. He, would he will get him into all truth. He'll, he'll sort all that out for you later on. Yeah. So, so Jesus, in his stage, 
and they're still not really mentally ready for it. Mm -hmm. it's, it's almost like they've been they've been hit they're like a punch bag. They've had one one shock and now there's one another shock and another shock. And Jesus said, Look, you know, your heads are just just take it easy because it'll be all taken care of in time. And sometimes we do that. We want we want the answer don't we want the answer to everything now? Yeah. You know, it's a bit like, you know, sometimes no. you can read a passage of scripture. <laughs> yeah. And then you read it lots of times and then you know something just clicks and you think, Oh that's that's what, what it's yeah. all about. That's what it's all about. Yeah. It is. I mean it, somebody can even tell you the day before. And, and it just goes straight away ahead. You know, it's got it. It's got to drop in its own time, uh, and just the way it is. You know. <coughs> okay. This is. You will see the the power when the whole Spirit, the Holy Spirit comes upon you, and you will be my witnesses in Jerusalem and Judea and Samaria and to the end of the earth. As we travel through the Book of Acts, that's what you're going to see develop. Starting off in Judea, then the message goes out to Samaria. Uh, uh, Start off in Jerusalem, Judea, Samaria, and into the ends of the earth. And it's power. It's power in the gospel. Here's a bunch of people who are bound in time. The Jewish people, very traditional, very, very locked in their ways. They've got a sacrificial system that's been on for thousands of years. And all that's going to be turned in his head in a couple of days' time. And then you've got the, the Gentiles who are out there doing their own thing and all sorts of stuff in their worship. Uh, you look at the, the Corinthians and the stuff that they were up to and stuff. You know, this is a, a, a wild world and the gospel of Christ is going to come out and it's going to take people from the Jewish faith and they're going to see, wow, so that's what it's all about. And it's going to take, take people from the Gentile world and, and these Jews and Gentiles have been a log ahead for years, thousands of years. And it's going to break down the barriers between them and make one new people. And down through time, there's you and there's me. God makes the difference through the Christ in our lives and brings people who normally probably, probably may not have anything to do with each other. He brings them into unity, into fellowship, into harmony in the, in the, in the uh, kingdom of God uh, and the family of God. Uh, looking to build on our strengths, looking to, to nudge off our weaknesses and make us a, a powerful people for God uh, in, in, his, in his future. Uh, I'm going to stop there because no point in going on to the next, uh, that's half of our stuff, we'll, we'll hold it there. All right. it's getting